Over 10 doctors who have been arrested openly or have been disappeared. And um, to start with, I uh, arrived in the Gaza Strip on Monday the 9th of October in the early hours of the morning. And that was a decision that I made uh, on the night of uh, the 7th of October, having realized that Gaza was about to face a uh, extremely brutal and uh, vicious attack. I um, reached out to my contacts in, uh, at MSF, who arranged for me to travel to Cairo on Sunday, and they may get across the Sinai Desert uh, in a car uh, to get into Gaza with the feeling that usually in these conflicts there's a small window at the very beginning that you can use to get in. On arrival to the Gaza Strip I went to a family house uh, but within half an hour um, the whole neighborhood had been uh, telephoned by the Israeli army and informed that particularly the um, tower blocks behind the house that I was in were going to be targeted by the Israeli Air Force. They, almost the whole neighborhood was in the street trying to run away. Um, I then moved to another uh, house and we were pinned down that night um, because of the severe bombing. In the early hours of Tuesday morning, when there was a lull in the fighting, I managed to go back to the damaged uh, building that I had evacuated and pick up my suitcase and then walk to Shifa Hospital from there. And from there on, I joined the uh, plastic and reconstructive surgery team at the Burns unit at Shifa Hospital. During the, my time at Shifa Hospital, it became apparent that 40 to 45 percent of all the wounded were going to be children. That there were uh, the primary target of the bombing was people's residential homes and that we were getting multi-generational uh, uh, um, patients from the same families in each uh, uh, air raid. Most of the injuries initially were blast injuries and these were severe soft tissue traumas, severe facial traumas, multiple fractures and then as time went, we saw the introduction of incendiary bombs where the patients would have um, over 40% of their total body surface area burnt with no other injuries. And by the time Shifa had collapsed, there were over 100 of these patients at Shifa Hospital. And we started seeing phosphorus burns. I had treated white phosphorus burns in the Gaza Strip during the 2009 war and was very familiar with the very characteristic uh, injuries and burns that they, they make. Um, as a chemical burn, phosphorus burns burn right through to the inner core of the body uh, and only stop when they have no exposure to oxygen. And so the burns would be, the patient would be basically puckered with burns that core right into the ribs, the bones, um, and unlike thermal burns that spread from the surface more horizontally. We also started to notice uh, the increased use of fragmentary missiles. Patients were coming in with very unique injury patterns. In normal blast injuries, the wound edge is covered with soot and is burnt and there's a lot of rubble, dirt, uh, clothes, metal inside the wound. These wounds were very clean cut. Unlike blast injuries where the amputation happens at the weakest part of the body, like the joints, these patients were having guillotine amputations in extremely tough parts of the body, in the mid-thigh, where you have to work your way through all of the muscles of the thigh and the, um, uh, the, uh, the thigh bone, the femur. Um, and they had serrated edges, as if what they had been hit by was a saw. 
really by the day four, day five, half of my operating list, which was around 10 to 12 cases every day, starting at eight or nine in the morning and finishing at one in the morning, uh, were children. Uh, my estimate is that there are now between 700 and 900 children with amputations of limbs, um, in some of whom multiple uh, limbs have been amputated. On one night uh, at the Ali Hospital, I performed amputations on six children. At one stage, when there was a call from one of the plastic surgery teams further up north uh, at Lauda Hospital, which is an NGO hospital where MSF has a, a base and a, and a unit there um, in Jabalia camp. I moved to um, uh, Lauda Hospital from Shifa. Um, on the third day that I was there, and in front of me, I witnessed a phone call by the Israeli army to the medical director of the hospital. And he was informed that unless he um, evacuates the hospital within two hours, the hospital was going to be targeted. Um, of course, that was not going to be possible. First of all, um, the job of the hospital is, is only to leave once all of the population is left. And two, that there were many patients that were too difficult to move. Um, we evacuated the, the patients that were, had been operated on were recovering from their injuries and I moved back to Shifa um, to rejoin the plastic surgery team there. While in Shifa, the number of burns and the number of pediatric injuries were increased. One of the most horrific scenes that I witnessed in Shifa Hospital was when, after the air raid and the, the, the dead and the wounded were brought in, members of the Shifa medical staff and nursing staff would be running frantically in the emergency department looking at the faces of the wounded and the dead to see whether their relatives had been uh, amongst the wounded and in many cases their children had been amongst the dead and the wounded. At what one point one of our colleagues, uh, Dr. Midhat Saidam, um, while at work his sister came with her children because they had been forced to evacuate their home. He decided to just take them to his house where his other siblings were uh, taking refuge. And a few hours later, he was killed along with all of his siblings and their children. His children and his wife were buried under the rubble and were only saved 24 hours later. Dr. Midhat uh, uh, Saidam became one of many doctors that were killed and we discovered after I came back and after the ceasefire, that another member of the plastic surgery team, a nurse working at the Burns unit, was also killed with his brother when their house was targeted. At what point the discussion was with Ahli Hospital, because of the overwhelming pressure on beds at Shifa, we had over 2,000 wounded in a hospital that had a bed capacity of 600. The decision was that I would move to Al Ahli Hospital, which we felt was safe because Al Ahli Hospital, as you all know, is owned and run by the World Council of Churches and managed by the Church of England here. On the morning uh, uh, of the massacre uh, at Al Ahli Hospital, I moved by ambulance from Shifa Hospital to Al Ahli. Al Ahli is the oldest hospital in Gaza. It had at some stage been called the English Hospital because it was <coughs> housed and it was the hospital in which British soldiers during this, the First World War were treated. And it was full of plaques that families of British soldiers had dedicated to their uh, loved ones. When we walked in to the hospital, I could notice that what had ha been happening in Shifa was happening at Al Ahli Hospital. The, uh, the hospital was turning into an internally displaced camp. There are lots of children and families in the grounds of Al Ahli Hospital. I went 
I saw the patient, made the decision uh, whom to operate on, made a list of 10 patients that needed surgery that day and another 10 that needed surgery the following day. And around, five, uh, around 12 o'clock that morning, we had a visit from the CEO of the hospital and the medical director, Dr. Maher Ayad. What had happened in the days before is that also Dr. Maher Ayad had received a phone call from the Israeli army, ordering him to evacuate the hospital. A day later, when he didn't, two, the Israeli drones fired two missiles at the fence of the hospital. And then he had received a second phone call from the same officer berating him for not having evacuated and telling him that unless he evacuated, the hospital was going to be hit. The reason why the, we had the visit from the management team is that we, they told us they had been in touch with the bishop in London and that he had received reassurances that we could carry on our work. By five o'clock, I had made this decision that I needed to operate uh, into the night and start early in the morning. And we, I, upon discussion, we made a decision that I would stay over and continue working at Lali. Later on that evening, between having wheeled out one of the patients and we're about to bring the next patient in, um, and there had been in the few hours before a lot of bombing around the hospital and you could kind of feel it shake. Um, there was an almighty whistling sound coming towards us, kind of indicative of missile, and then a huge explosion. If it, it was obvious from the size of the explosion and the, um, the damage that it was either at the edge of the hospital or within the hospital. The false ceiling in the operating room fell on top of us. Luckily, I wasn't uh, injured and I walked out of the operating room into a corridor that you could see the forecourt of the, op uh, of the hospital in, where the families had be I'd seen the families earlier on. The ambulances were on fire. Uh, um, some of the cars were on fire. And the forecourt, which had been lit by that fire, was uh, um, full of bodies and parts of bodies. I made my way through, the, and you saw some of the video there. That's a video that I took uh, at Al Ahli through the, the, the survivors trying to get to the other end of the hospital. I w went to the um, um, emergency department. The first patient that I saw on my right was a man in his mid-50s with an amputation at the level of the mid-thigh, similar to those guillotine amputations that I was telling you about. And there was blood spurting through the, the exposed arteries in his stump. I uh, took his belt and tied it as a tourniquet, and then set about trying to find someone's shirt to take it and tie it as a second tourniquet, and uh, try to resuscitate him. Once I was satisfied that he had been uh, stabilized, I moved on to another patient who had received a single shrapnel to his neck uh, and that shrapnel had hit one of the vessels in his neck and blood was spurting out of the neck. I uh, put my hand on the wound to try to stop the bleeding and found someone else to put their hand and started resuscitating that patient. While I was resuscitating the patient, the um, ambulance staff uh, started to arrive and I had a tap on my, the, my shoulder, looked behind and there was a stretcher with, with some paramedics. We moved him to the stretcher. I kept my hand on his neck so that we'd stop the bleeding and helped carry him outside. And we walked out into the forecourt to try to get to the ambulances. And that's when I saw the, the full extent of the uh, carnage in the forecourt. Not only were there lots of dead bodies, but there are also parts of bodies. And, and I remember walking past the amputated uh, forearm of a child. I took him to the ambulance 
I uh, then uh, went with him to Shifa Hospital, and that's when the rest of the um, wounded came uh, from Shifa, uh, from Al Ahli to Shifa as they were brought in. And then when we had triaged and stabilized the patients and sent them up to the operating room, I went in and rejoined the burns unit at Shifa Hospital. For the following few days, I just rejoined the team at Shifa Hospital, and we were seeing more and more children, more and more burns, but we were also seeing a phenomena at Shifa, which by the time Shifa had been uh, completely uh, uh, surrounded by the Israelis, there were 120 uh, children uh, at Shifa Hospital who were wounded children with no surviving families. Uh, some of whom were too young for us to even know their names. These had been taken out of the rubble and there was no one left to care for them. There were over 100 major burns and the bed crisis at Shifa had reached to the point where the wounded were being uh, looked after on mattresses in the floors of the corridors, in the floors of the wards, in the emergency department. Um, I stayed at Shifa for a while, for a few days, until um, the team at Lali Hospital was able to fix two of the operating rooms and reopen the ground floor um, so that at least Lali could be partially functioning again. Because of the pressures on Shifa, where we were um, less and less able to operate on patients because of uh, lack of medication, lack of um, consumables, lack of anesthetic. Um, I started. I decided to go back to Ahli, but on a shuttle basis, I would take five or six patients from Shifa Hospital to Ahli Hospital, operate on them there, and then uh, initially first day uh, uh, come back to to Ahli and join the team at the end of that working day, <coughs> and operate, and then go in the morning back to Ahli and take some more cases. Um, that continued until one morning I was uh, in the ambulance uh, trying to go to Shifa because I had promised a colleague whose son had a severe facial injury that I would operate on his son at Shifa. And when we were in the ambulance I could see at the end of the road uh, Israeli APCs crossing across the, the street that we were in. And we turned around and came back. That night, we had an influx of patients whose families managed to get them out of Shifa Hospital before it was completely surrounded. But also, we became the only functioning hospital in the whole of Gaza City, and with the exception of the Indonesian hospital, the only functioning hospital in the northern part of Gaza. We started then receiving direct injuries to uh, Al Ahli Hospital. Um, and the Palestine Red Crescent Society, which manages the ambulance service in um, uh, the Gaza Strip, um, set up a trauma stabilization field, uh, field uh, hospital inside the grounds of the Ali Hospital. For that period afterwards, we started seeing more and more of these fragmentary missiles. But we also started seeing, and for the first time since I was in Gaza, people with, um, patients with high velocity sniper injuries. And we could hear the distinctive noise that the quadcopter makes, followed by a single shot. On one day we received uh, 20 patients. Um, there was a mother and child. Um, there were some brought in dead from the quadcopters, and we discovered that these quadcopters had been um, released in the roads that were leading up to Al Ahli Hospital. These, pa these patients, these wounded, were trying to come to Al Ahli to see family or for medical emergencies rather than for wound emergencies, because by that time, all of the hospitals in Gaza, including the pediatric hospitals, had been completely neutralized and put out of service. These injuries are very distinctive because the 
size of the inlet wound to the outlet wound is disproportionate. The inlet wound is a very small stellate shaped wound and the outlet wound where that high velocity, high energy bullet comes out is bigger than a, a clenched fist. I remained at Ahli Hospital uh, but witnessed the dwindling of the supplies and some of the patients, especially the little girl whose leg was covered in shrapnel that you saw, we started having to perform extremely painful procedures, including on that nine-year-old girl without anesthetic. Um, patients were starting to develop wound infections and at the minimum we needed to clean the wounds so that uh, we can hopefully, once things stabilize, operate on them. The final straw came when a mosque in Sabra uh, uh, neighborhood was targeted. 60 people had been brought in dead and hundreds were wounded. That night we operated um, into f early hours of the following morning, around 5 o'clock. I was informed by my colleagues that we had run out of anesthetic and that the operating rooms would no longer be able to look after patients. That's when I made the decision to uh, go to the south because I had felt that as a surgeon with no access to, uh, to operating rooms, no access to morphine, no access to ketamine, which is a kind of veterinary anesthetic that we used to use on patients, uh, there was nothing for me to do. And that was day 40 of my stay in Gaza. Well, the Israeli military has responded to those claims, insisting that it has complied with international law. They say that the primary smokescreen shells used by the IDF do not contain white phosphorus. Like many Western militaries, the IDF also possesses smokescreen shells that include white phosphorus that are legal under international law. These shells are used by the IDF for creating smoke screens and not for targeting or causing fires and are not defined under laws as incendiary weapons.